drink. <laughs> I was going to have this little routine, like, you know, if it's too far away from me, just go like that, close like that, and I thought, no, maybe this kind of thing is not going to work. <laughs> so this is great, isn't it? Great to sort of hear lots of academics, um, not for you to learn anything, but for us to try and ditch some of the stereotypes that we have. And the first time I realised I was being stereotyped, I was out around here, actually, many years ago. Uh, me and my friend were out in the town and we met a couple of guys, and mine was the cutest. And you know those, like, girls, you know you have those friends, right? And they're really nice to you until they fancy your fella. And then you see the other side of them. It was like that. She said, Mark, because that was the name of my fellow, she said, did you know that Den's a doctor? Doctor of psychology. Don't you find that intimidating? <laughs> I know I do. And I was like, <laughs> he did look intimidated. And then he started to look shifty. And it's like, what's going on with you? And he's like, well, you can read my mind, can't you? Like, I think Flo mentioned this. It's like, no. Um, and then I started thinking, hang on, why are you looking so worried that I can read your mind? <laughs> worried because I think as Flo mentioned we, we study what we're bad at and I think if you were going to try and come up with a collective noun for a psychologist it wouldn't be far off something like Asperger's. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if you had a normal person come home and they sensed a bit of a frosty atmosphere they'd say oh what's wrong darling? Have you anything, anything up? Psychologists would say okay on a scale properly validated of one to five, one being very pissed off, five being not at all pissed off, how pissed off are you? <laughs> So it's crazy, you know, we, we, in the social sciences at least, we study what we're bad at. And when I moved to the management school, that was no exception. They couldn't manage a piss up in a brewery, I tell you. <laughs> when I was there, they were trying to move from management school to business school. And I was like, oh guys, this must be a time of, of a great change, you know. Um, it turned out they'd been at it for years. And I, years, I put my great intellectual mind to it. I thought, what does that involve? Uh, changing the letterhead? So I could come up with, but no, there were consultations, there were meetings, there were forums, there were updates. It took them decades. And uh, a friend of mine had a story about one of the members of staff that I think illustrates the point I'm trying to make. And he said, well, well one of our guys was a hot air balloonist in his spare time, and he was trying to get somewhere, and he, he, he got a bit lost. And so he noticed someone below him, so he let some of the hot air out, and like, so, oh, way there, oh, way there. And this woman looks up and she says, yes, what's the matter? And he says, well, I'm supposed to meet my friend in an hour and I've, I've got no idea where I am, um, so I didn't know where to go. And, and, you know, can you help me? And she says, yes, you're hovering 30 feet off the ground, you're 41 degrees west latitude, you're 50 degrees north longitude. And he says, you must be an engineer. <laughs> and she says, yes, how do you know? And he says, well, what you told me is technically accurate but I'm actually no better off. I still don't know where I am or how to get to my friend. And she says, you must be a manager. <laughs> I says, how did you know? And she says, well, you've made promises you can't keep. You don't know where you are or where you're going. You've risen to where you are for vast quantities of hot air. <laughs> you're looking at people, <laughs> you're looking at the people a bit beneath you to solve your problems for you. <laughs> And the fact is, you're in exactly the same position you were before we met, but now somehow it's my fault. <laughs> so you might be thinking, hang on a minute, what are you doing in the business school when you're a psychologist? And, and actually, that is a bit of a problem. I have to admit it, I've been a butterfly in my research. I've done a bit of this, I've done a bit of that. And if I were going to give any advice to aspiring academics here, I would say focus, focus, focus. Pick yourself a subject, focus right in on the minute eye of it, okay? Publish. Publish in a very obscure journal, too obscure for Have I Got News For You, where you might find five, even six people will read it, hotly dispute your findings. I mean, for example, you wouldn't study something like animals. No, you'd study something like the enzymatic reactions of the protuberous of the menstruating anteater. <laughs> um, I don't know if that makes sense. I made it up. I, I don't actually know if anteaters menstruate, but I put it in because like, anteaters are just kind of funny, aren't they? And, and my son says, women aren't funny. Stand-up comedian women are not funny because all they do is talk about periods, so that's shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so, focus. I haven't followed that advice at all, and that came up in my last appraisal with my manager. 
and he says, um, okay, your vague subject is business ethics. Um, what, what's your research? What are you doing? And I said, well, I've done a bit of research on sustainability in hairdressing, actually. And he, he wasn't that impressed, but he, he didn't know any hair. Um, <laughs> something which I've learned from my research is that if you wash your hair every day, shampoo once, rinse, shampoo twice, rinse, condition, rinse, blow dry, you are using 584 kilograms of carbon dioxide. But if you only shampoo twice a week and just once, not twice, and use dry shampoo and leave-in conditioner, which actually adds a lot of body to the hair, you're only using 25 kilograms of carbon dioxide. I tell you what, this is quite intimidating. Uh, talking to students, doing lectures is a little bit intimidating. There's nothing more intimidating than going into a room of perfectly coiffured hairdressers trying to teach them how to reduce their product use on a bad hair day. <laughs> so, you know, my manager said, okay, all right. You know, once he realised that I'd found out how to reduce the UK's greenhouse gas emissions by 25% and improve hair condition, he said, okay, great. Where, where are you going to go with this? Are you going to publish? What's your next step? What's your, what's your next bit of follow-up research? So I told him about my research in Cuba. And he's like, huh? Cuba? And I think he had a suspicion it was a bit of a jolly disguised as research. Um, but then he just saw where he worked and he thought, I've got the connection. Cuba's the only sustainable country. I read that. Is that what it is? It's like, no. Um, I'm looking at the pharmaceutical industry. And he's like, what's that got to do with, with business ethics? You know, you're straying very far from your field now, Denise. I've told you about this. Focus, focus, focus. Publish, publish, publish. And it's like, well, no, it, it, it is an ethical issue, isn't it? Because we trust the pharmaceutical industry to protect our health, don't we? And we live in a free market economy, and the reason we don't nationalise everything is because we think that competition leads to innovation, and it's for the benefit of everyone. So how come the state-run pharmaceutical sector in Cuba, a tiny, very, very poor country, is outperforming the entire American and European pharmaceutical sector? I went there to find out. <laughs> it turns out that their metric of success, their business strategy, is health. Their business model is based on promises that Fidel Castro made in 1959 when he won the revolution and he promised the people of Cuba that his first priority would be their health needs, their education, their housing, their security. And he stuck to that promise through thick and thin for 50 years. I, it made me cry a little bit, because I thought of all everyone who's come and gone, and yet he's stuck to that. And you look at Western pharmaceutical industry, and their metric of success is profit. And actually it turns out it's not that profit maximising to make treatments or drugs for important diseases that people need treated. Because actually cancer's a real bugger, it's really difficult. Um, AIDS, there's no point in that, they can't pay. So we end up with 101 drugs to treat acid reflux. <laughs> was an ethical issue. So anyway, what I didn't tell uh, my boss, but I will tell you because we're in a Cuban bar, is I did become a little bit of a fidelista. And fidelista is a term for those who love Fidel Castro. And Fidel Castro is a bit like Marmite, you love him or hate him. I loved him, because um, that, that little tale of his, his speech of Havana moved me, but many hate him, those who hate him, hate him real bad. He's had 638 plots on his life, and he's still alive. It's amazing, you've got to hand it to the guy. And they're so funny as well. There's one where they tried to poison him, but they had to keep the poison in the fridge because it went off and then it stuck to the side of the freezer the moment they had a chance to, to get it to him. <laughs> <laughs> They've shot him. They, they noticed that he went snorkeling, so they planted a bomb <laughs> in one of those big conches uh, where he went snorkeling. But Fidel knows his, his shell life and he's like, that conch isn't native to the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> and then they sent uh, a mistress, he had a mistress, and uh, they, the CIA got hold of her, they fed her a load of stuff, and brainwashed her, paid lots of money to go back and kill him. He spotted it straight away, he says, you've come to kill me, haven't you? And she said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so he gave her his gun, he said, go on, shoot me. Anyway, she couldn't, she just fell back in love with him and they shagged and that was that. No one's managed. <laughs> No one's managed to, 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 to bump him off. He's, he's still there. So anyway, I was very good, mindful of my, uh, my manager's thing, Publish, Publish, Publish. We wrote a really, really good paper comparing uh, the Western pharma with the Cuban pharmaceutical model. And we tried to get it published. 
and he got rejected on the basis that Fidel Castro is a brutal dictator who's ruined the lives of many of his people. Oh, my co-authors were incensed. You know, they wrote a three-page rant saying, do you know that Cuba, who's been on the recipient of the most brutal embargo ever known to man of 50 years almost by the, uh, by the US, lack of resources, a very, very poor country, outperforms most of the rest of the world in terms of healthcare, in terms of literacy, in terms of racial and gender equality, in terms of infant mortality, in terms of life expectancy. How is that ruining the lives of your people? You know, um, why don't you just take yourself off to Cuba and see the high level of political participation and freedom of speech before you stop talking out of your arse? And anyway, I thought, perhaps that lacks a little bit of academic neutrality? <laughs> So I thought very hard about my response, and I thought, well, I might just point, there's no point in good research unless you get it out there. It is a valid point. So what am I going to do? I can't let one ignorant reviewer bring me down. And then the answer was obvious. It came to me in a flash. Fidel the Musical. <laughs>